Hello, and welcome to Season 12 of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. Each week we watch the same movie on our own and then hop on a call to discuss it. This season, the theme is blatant pandering. We're going to review 10 movies that were either made in or set in the U.S. states that have downloaded the most episodes of The Horrific over the last few years. This will be a shorter season, so we may work in some listener recommendations and horror news along the way, too. Thanks for listening. So here's the thing I'm sorry about last week, okay? My baby boy's back. I'm back. Uh, yeah, that, that was my bad. That was all on me. Didn't make it very far into the season before we had to call a little audible, but mm-hmm. now I'm back home, back in Texas. Yeah. Back on my jam. How's it feel to be back in Texas? Feels wonderful. It's. I really enjoyed the trip. I love Berlin. I hope to mm. go back for shorter periods of time in right. the future. But I wouldn't want to live anywhere but right where I'm at. I'm kind of at the point in my life where I think I could just live the rest of my life without leaving Oklahoma. Don't you say that. Well, I, I guess Don't I'm at the point in my life it. where I, I'm going to plant yeah. my roots and I could just stay. I don't well, really care about other sh- states. <laughs> That's why we're recording a podcast. <laughs> Especially not. Well, fuck. They don't care about uh, us anymore. I'll, uh, uh, I'm not editing this one. Yeah, right. I know. I'm well aware <laughs> of who will be editing Cut this that one. Cut out, please. As penance for uh, all these weeks of not being around. But yeah. Yeah. Well, we are still in season 12. And <laughs> we just got we- here. Since we haven't talked about it much, <laughs> yeah. Season twelve is about us pandering to our top listeners. Yeah. So we use a website called Libsyn to publish our podcast. It also aggregates the stats, and we can see who are the ten states where we have the most downloads. And this season, we are going to do episodes about movies that were either filmed in or set in those states. So if it sounds complicated, it is a little bit, but that's probably just because you don't live in one of them and you don't listen enough, so I don't care. Uh, also, there's been a adminium, if that's a word, to this as well. We got two that we're going to do from England. Oh, sweet. Listener yeah. requests, so we got two, you know. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I will always make time for listener requests. And I think we are also coming up on a time when a lot of movies that we have been excited about are going to be released in the theater. And so I think we will probably at least do some, you know, quick updates. Uh, You know, maybe one of us can see it. Maybe we just read the reviews or whatever. But, yeah. Definitely. So anyway, this week, as I kind of already foreshadowed inadvertently, we are doing a movie that is pandering to our listeners in Texas. Stars at night, big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. I knew you had to finish it. <laughs> Your official Texan. Man, oh, yeah, it's good. a legal thing. Too, <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we did From Dusk Till Dawn this yeah. week. And I'm pretty excited about it. I have not seen this movie in a long time, but I have seen it, and I'm assuming you have too. Yeah, this was actually – so one of the um, – when I saw Texas on there, I was like, well, we can't – we've already done Texas Chainsaw Massacres. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, from dusk till dawn. Like, it was yeah. just one of those – one of yeah. those times, you know, super stoked about it um, because I'd seen it. And as you'll tell throughout this podcast, I'm a fan of it. Yeah, this one I feel like is definitely up your alley. A hundred percent. It was written by Quentin Tarantino and directed by Robert Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is just such like a classic 90s Tarantino movie. I mean, just all the swearing and all the violence. Uh, But I feel like it was also like a quintessentially Danny Trejo movie. (laughs) Yes, it was. Like like if you are just like, yeah, picture a movie with Danny Trejo. You're like, yeah, that's kind of basically it and i was glad that it did not disappoint on any of those fronts yeah i think uh one of the things that i was reading about was like there was only i guess there's multiple so there's from dust till dawn two and three as well yes and like there's only a couple people that are still that were like carry over Mm -hmm. and i think 
Danny Trejo was one of them. And I just loved it. I was like, yeah. that's, that's amazing because, you know, he, he dies in the brain. first, you know, yeah, he dies yeah. in the first one. So I was like, that's, that's awesome. I yeah. haven't seen it, but that was something I was reading. So if that's not true, then I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I was also doing some reading on Robert Rodriguez and I know he did once upon a time in Mexico and Sin City and Machete. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like also spy kids and shark boy and lava girl. <laughs> yeah. So I no idea. <laughs> right. And I think that was like, I watched a documentary or like a thing on him. Um, I think it was from the planet terror, like DVD said I had or something. And it was talking yeah. like for, for his kids, you know, his kids are a huge, um, they're in a lot of his films and stuff. And I think mm. that that was the the case for for those, but um, yeah, it's it's such a strange. Like, I think that's awesome, though. I think it's awesome to yeah. be like, yeah. hey, I'm you know directed from dusk till dawn, and Shark Boy and Lava Girl. <laughs> like, like, I just think it's amazing. He's like, I needed at least one movie in my canon uh, that my kids were allowed to see. Yeah, so. I mean, I'd be willing to bet. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. Obviously, we're excited about this movie. It's one that we both enjoyed. Mm. I'll do the introduction, and then I'm going to ask you if you have any fun facts, and then we will get into the Mm. blood-sucking, sunlight-exploding, gory details. Get them. In 1996, Miramax Films brought us From Dusk Till Dawn, an edgy horror film written by Robert Rodriguez and directed by Quentin Tarantino. In this film, two violent criminals on the run kidnap a family who take a break from their RV tour at a roadside motel. What starts as a tense escape tale turns into a wild fight for survival during a night spent in Mexico's most horrific biker bar. From Dust Till Dawn was made on a budget of around $19 million and brought in almost $60 million at the box office. It has achieved cult status and now has several sequels. It can currently be rented for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Perfect. Mike, drop. It felt so right to be back Ooh. in the set. What did you learn about this movie? So, I'm going to tell you something I learned and then something about the movie. Something I learned is that our top ten states change frequently. I'm looking at the list now. We got a couple that popped in that we didn't have before. So, they can't see it, right? Nah. So then we're good. Yeah. Also, uh, I bet we all of a sudden have some downloads from Berlin, Germany, but I don't think we should count. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm gonna look. So to the facts, what everyone comes over for. So this was technically Tarantino's first paid writing gig. He got paid fifteen hundred dollars for the script. Hmm which I think is interesting. The other thing I thought was interesting was like, you know, with Tarantino films, like dialogue is huge and he's like a master of it. In my, in my opinion. Yeah. And I didn't think that we necessarily have that. I mean, there was definitely like the Tarantino dialogue, like the start of it kind of, but like it wasn't as in depth, like what we would get with like, I don't know, kill bill or whichever, you know, whichever one. Um, that he's done since then. But I just thought that was interesting. He he did get paid fifteen hundred dollars from it, and then he's homies with uh, Robert Rodriguez too. So yeah. Um, the other so you know, and, and because he wrote it in the in in this uh, film initially, he had the um, Ezekiel twenty five seventeen speech that he that uh, Samuel L. Jackson says in Pulp Fiction. Um, oh yeah. So he it was actually in this one and. Uh, he ended up it was originally in the script and it was meant to be spoken by Harvey Keitel the the preacher in in this or the dad and um, as he was like fending off vampires and then you know they cut it thankfully because I feel like Samuel L. Jackson saying it was just like super intense in Pulp Fiction so yeah Um, the other facts I have is um, some Hayek's character in this um, initially was called Blonde Death. But Hayek has, you know, she's a brunette. Yeah, right. And so they, Tarantino changed it to Satanico Pandemon- Pandemonium, 
which is a, a Mexican horror film that he remembered from his uh, times working at a, a film store, hmm. which just love. I, 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 I don't know. I just love the tie-in, you know? Yeah. I feel like that kind of shows, like, true horror fans or film fans, maybe. So also in this, there is Tom Savini. Mm-hmm. He's the prosthetic makeup artist. We've talked about him on here before. Like, he's just the OG. I mean, he's just insane. Like, um, the work that he's done, just look him up. He's on, we've, we've done it like Dawn of the Dead. He was, he was in that. He was one of the guards. Um, but he also does like the blood and makeup for him and just like reshaped it, it all. Like, he's, he's a hero in the makeup horror film uh, area. He is Sex Machine. In this movie. Oh, okay. I was trying to figure out why he looked familiar. Yeah. And then I just saw the name and I'm like, who, who is that? But yeah. now that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, they also had a bunch of exploitation or not a bunch, but they had exploitation idols. So, um, Tom Saxon, uh, plays the FBI agent chase um, he's an actor who ple- appeared in Enter the Dragon, other films. Fred Williamson, who plays Frost, who rips the heart out of the mm-hmm. the, the vampire, um, was in many popular black exploitation films in the seventies, uh, and the original movie inspiration for Inglorious Bastards. Um, he he was in so. Tarantino, like, you could tell with his filmmaking that that's, like, his thing. Like, you know, the exploitation, you could tell with music and style, you know, and all that. Audio, or vocals, and, and things like that. And it, I just I just love paying homage to the people who you're like, yeah, I love their films. I want to put them in now that I make films. But those yeah. are the facts that I got for the podcast. Very nice. We are back in mid-season form. It's like we didn't even go anywhere. (laughs) Yeah. So this movie, I feel like, was kind of had two parts. Like it almost like the vibe of the movie was different. And I feel like even like the the subgenre of horror that it was trying to be was different. And the beginning was very much kind of like natural born killers, strangers, House of a Thousand Corpses style. You've just got two really bad dudes, and then you have a family that's being like preyed upon by them. And they really, really, I thought, did some interesting things to develop those characters and to make you afraid of them. Yeah. And so that's George Clooney and Quentin Tarantino were the actors. They're two brothers. They've, uh, Clooney was, had been arrested and Tarantino broke him out and they're on the run. And they have murdered people and robbed banks and done all this stuff. And so you're kind of getting, you're hearing about them by reputation in the beginning. It's like the cop is talking to the cashier. And then there's the big, like, shootout and everything. And then there's the scene in the hotel when they first get there with their hostage that I feel like was such a well done and, like, interesting way of. So basically, instead of showing Tarantino, like, kill and torture the lady, Clooney leaves, and then he comes back, and they're just having this very normal conversation. And he's like, wait, where's where's the hostage? And he's like, she's in there. And then he goes, and he looks, and then you just see, like, his face. Yeah. And then they're doing, like, the flashes of just, like, the gore and the blood and everything that's in that room. Yeah. As you can tell that he's just, like almost gagging, like looking at it and trying to like figure out what to do about the situation and stuff. And just in that short amount of time in the beginning of the movie, I thought they did such a good job of making you absolutely terrified of those two characters that by the time the family shows up and then they come into the room, you're just like on full alert, like, like adrenaline because you are so worried about what's about to happen. Yeah. And that's without, really spending a lot of money or doing anything really crazy other than just some cool camera work. Yeah. I think, uh, it definitely sets what, what I think they do with the beginning is kind of set the page. Like these guys are like, you don't know what's going to happen next, you know? 
Yeah. Like that was the last thing that you thought was going to happen was the, the shootout in the, in the gas station at the beginning saying like, help us or, you know, that whole, that whole scene. But then like the bank teller or whatever she was, bank manager, um, being killed was like, okay, like he's obviously like unhinged. Like you already know that, you know, not that, so you already know, like he's he's a killer, he's a rapist, like he's just you could talk about Quentin Tarantino's character, just not like a good person, but like yeah. that was established from early on, which kind of set the precedence for the precedence for the rest of the film. Yeah. You know, so like you don't know what he could try to attack um, Juliet Lewis character uh, at any moment. He could, you know, he's just unhinged. You know, he just shoot someone at the brink, blink of an eye, kind of thing. And I think that kind of helped their characters because I don't necess- I ha- I struggled to see George Clooney as a bad guy, yeah, which he definitely was in this film. But I still struggle with it. But I think the Quentin Tarantino character kind of picked that up and was able to show like, hey, we're like we're not good people. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. and I, I think that with Clooney, with his character, he was like the perfect choice for it. Because especially in the scenes like when they were in the RV and he's talking to the dad and is and he's trying to, like, reassure him that, like, yeah, if you just get us there, you wait with us until the morning, we'll let you go. You have my word. And he's very smooth and charming almost. And, Mm -hmm. like, you want to believe him, even though, you know, from everything that happened so far that you probably shouldn't. But it's just. I feel like he, as an actor, was able to pull off that role of kind of the, like, yes, he's obviously a bad guy, and we all know that, but also we kind of want to believe he's better than that and, like, that he'll keep his word Mm -hmm. because he's just charming. And that's why Clooney should probably just run for president. Well, okay. I support you. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, so... They end up going to this super divey Mexican trucker bar called the Titty Twister. Yeah, and, a bar uh, that looks like it would be between Oklahoma and the middle of Kansas. Yes. Yeah. Right. That we yeah. would have stopped at. Yes. No, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's full. It's super, like, seedy. Um, and they're supposed to – in this part of the story I didn't fully understand, but I guess they were supposed to wait there until the next morning because – Clooney's business partners or people who were going to somehow get him to safety or something were supposed to meet them there. Yeah. And so the premise of the movie was that they were supposed to stay in the super rough bar all night. And they kind of set it up where it's like Clooney and Tarantino are both very like unhinged. And so they're just on the edge of getting in a huge brawl and maybe getting themselves and all of them killed the whole time. And Harvey, the dad is trying to talk them into not, doing that basically and just being cool until the next morning so that, you know, they can go to safety and then he can leave with his family and stuff. And so this whole time, it's just like this tension that's building and you're worried that the guys are going to do something stupid and then they're all going to get killed for no reason when they were so close to being free and on and on and on. And then all of a sudden it just becomes a vampire movie. Yeah. And it still took me by surprise when that switch flipped this time because I was just so, like, in the moment of it. And I mm-hmm. knew what was coming. Like, yeah. <laughs> there was no, like, element of surprise other than that it was just a well-made film that did that exactly the way that it wanted to. Yeah. And I, yeah, to add on to that, the reason why you could tell a, a well-made film, like, I would have complained, like, it took them, you know, almost an hour to show, like, the first vampire. Yeah. You know, like, I would have been, like, kind of frustrated or irritated, but, like, being that the first part of it was so like was well made that it was like okay no this is totally cool this technically means i have like an hour left of like uh vampire you know yeah. footage so that's that's dope so i thought it was i thought not showing them sooner was actually pretty smart made sense it made um, it way more shocking yeah def- definitely did and then like tying into that with the vampires themselves like you had some of them that looked like they had bat noses, you know, like they just, mm-hmm. um, it was just getting away from like the, the pretty boy vampire look like these guys 
yeah just brutal you know you don't you don't want anything to do with them yeah uh not like you would want anything to do with the vampire anyway but with these they just look disgusting yeah they were much more like primal almost like creature yeah. more so than yeah. you know the the classic um like good looking vampire yeah like the, kind the, of i guess thing, the yeah. the stereotypical dracula yeah, we'll yeah say. i think that Tom Savini, yet again, you know, we could probably thank him for it. You know, I know it had to be signed off on, but, um, but still like, yeah, that was the, the, the makeup and, and stuff. I mean, yet again, they were trying to look like vampires and there was a couple of times I was like, that CGI does not look good. Uh, but yeah. it's from 1995. So yeah. it makes sense. That was one thing I did have in my notes was that I felt like the strengths of this movie, aside from like the acting and the writing, were the practical effects and the blood splatters and stuff. Like, I feel like everything they did with the gore and anything that was a practical effect was great and really pulled off well yeah. and effective. The weaknesses, though, were that the CG was just distractingly bad in a lot of places. And, yeah. you know, again, you know, for for the time. It was probably not that bad, but to me, looking at it now, it's course heavy. That's what I was kind of wondering because I hadn't seen seen it in quite a while. Yeah, um, and then I was kind of wondering, I was like, has it been so long that I just forgot that the CGI was rough, or yeah, or what? But then you know, yet again, mid nineties, you know, so yeah, it's gonna, it's not gonna be the greatest. But here's yeah. another thing that kind of frustrated me was I re I ended up renting this because it was <laughs> on Showtime. I'm not about that life. And then I was just before the podcast was getting my son ready because he's going to his Grammys and I bought this movie. I don't know. It was still in the plastic wrap just <laughs> oh, sitting in my front. Yeah. It was like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. So I wasted money, but I yeah. I'd add that in there. Yeah. As far as genres go, I think I kind of like tip my hand a bit there, but I feel like this one falls into two because the first part of the movie is so different from the second. Yep. But the first one is pretty, I think, like going from our list, psychological, and then underneath that home invasion and survival, that really, you know, fits, right? Like that's, Absolutely. that's kind of what it was going for. Yeah. And it was really effective and really intense. But then I feel like it, it's almost too easy to say that the last part was vampire because it, it almost, like like you were talking about, the way that they portrayed the vampires was much more in line with like, um, like some kind of unknown creature from nature. Like they, to me, it yeah. almost, they almost felt more like werewolves than they did vampires. And then the way that the horror was, it felt a lot more like what you would expect from the tropes of a zombie movie mm -hmm. than a vampire movie. Oh yeah. No, I, I couldn't be on the same page anymore. I was thinking like, this is kind of like a monster because you do have, sex machine turn into like a rat looking thing <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Well, and even like they all look normal during the day and then at night was when they like changed. You yeah. Know? So it wasn't like they were like full time looking like that vampires. Right. Yeah. And, but no, I mean the first half, like that could have been, I think on like a, and I, I, this is probably going to sound bad, but I think maybe like a lazier writer, like could have just turned that, I know this sounds bad, but that's what, not what I'm meaning. But they could have just used that first half and finished it with that, and it would have been pretty horrible. You know, mm -hmm. I I don't think it would have been like Funny Games bad, um, but like you know, pretty brutal. But the fact that they threw in like the the zo the zombies monsters, you know, and yeah. I think it's also was it also buried on like a Aztec like burial ground or something like that. Uh, technically, it was a Mayan oh, pyramid. Mayan. Yeah. What did I say? Aztec. Oh. Uh, Actually, it might have been. I just, that was the, when I looked up, like, who built Chichen Itza, it was Mayan, and it looked kind of like that. that so that's sense. why I put it in my notes. should have known that from Age of Empires 2. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so, you know, technically it was on there, so it was, like, even mystical, you know, all of the above. It just kind of, yeah. kind of, you know, hit home on all the genres that, you know, which I think is just awesome just makes a great film i like films that start off with one and it's just like hey this is what it is we're digging our heels in and we're sticking to this genre um but this one was pretty dope yeah i think the way that they were so committed to doing the first part well 
again, yeah. it was the thing that made the second part hit. Yeah. I think that if it had been more of them fighting like bad CG bats, it would have been not as good of a movie. Yeah. So it, it was kind of cool. Like, I feel like the two parts complemented each other well. And speaking of complementing each other, I have to apologize and compliment you because according to Wikipedia, it was an Aztec temple. That's what I'm talking about. Boy. Yep. yep. Uh, feels good. I will admit defeat. It's it still a good movie, so though. So good, dude. No, yeah. it was it was so good. I was I mean, I just love it. Like it was yeah. one of those where like when I realized I bought it, I was actually really happy because I was like, hell yeah, I don't yeah. have to worry about renting this sucker again. Yeah. Um, it, it, the other thing too, like I struggled with the end. So I want to talk about the ending real quick. Yeah. I struggle with that a little bit. So the, and I'm talking with the ending from when Carlos and his gang shows up. Yeah. Cause the way this film is like, it, it's built up to a big fight Yeah, and then, you know, they, they make it out and the way they make it out, I thought was really fun, uh, an interesting way of doing that too. I thought that was kind of cool, but, um, the the in so at the end all you have is Juliet Lewis's character alive and George Clooney's character alive um that was in the bar the night before and uh you know Juliet Lewis wants to go with George Clooney for like that security it or you know just I don't know if that's why but you know just wanted to go with him and he was saying no. And initially I was kind of thinking like, are they trying to do like a Casablanca or I don't know, whatever, <laughs> yeah. gaunt, whichever like old school, you know, film where they're like, they don't like love doesn't win at the end. But then yeah. I got to thinking like, um, no, I think the case is that he realizes that he's like, I don't want to say piece of shit, but just like not the same. <laughs> like he's just the exact opposite, even though she did a whole bunch of killing, it was vampires. So that's cool. And like, she was just going to be in more danger wherever he went. Yeah. You know? And so I kind of, I had to figure that one out myself just because initially I was kind of annoyed. I was like, what, why wouldn't she just go? Like, why wouldn't you just let her go? Like it doesn't, makes sense like you just had a pretty traumatic night you know you both saved each other like go on to the next adventure but i liked how they split it off at the end yeah definitely a, a good setup for a sequel yeah but also one thing that stood out to me on the ending and this was the last thing in my notes and i was kind of thinking about it after the fact but it was interesting to me how it seemed like uh Seth, so George Clooney's character, Seth, he was very much like about his brother and protecting his brother and stuff the whole time. But then in the end, he just kind of used his brother's death as like a bargaining chip to yeah. get more money. You know what I mean? Like, like he's trying to, because he's like, you know, it cost me my brother's life in there and this was so terrible and on and on and on. So I should probably just pay you a little less than what you'd originally asked for. And it's just like, oh, he's just. He's been a manipulator yeah. the whole time. You know what I mean? He's telling people what they want to hear and he's kind mm -hmm. of working the system and stuff. And so I thought that was like a really revealing moment because then at the end, after his brother was dead, who was supposed to be, you know, the, the person he was, you know, protecting and, and motivated by this whole time. It's like, nah, he's just saving himself and, and is getting, trying to get his money. And his brother was a tool that he used just like everything else. And so well, I, see, to extent though, but think about the, the mouth guard, scene do you remember that from the when they're in the mm -hmm. rv yeah. and he's like yeah, yeah. put your mouth guard in like basically say like don't forget that because i don't want your teeth going bad <laughs> like yeah, it was almost right. it was almost like a a parent thing but no you're abs you are right with like using that death as a bargaining at the end like where most people would probably want to just like change your life around or something yeah it didn't stop him which is I think part of the writing, you know, that you could think for that, but yeah, absolutely right. I mean, if we were in that situation and you were go, I would get 10%. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Might as well. Yeah. Well, the difference is, uh, we wouldn't ever be in that situation because we'd have each other's backs and work our way out there. That's true. That's true. And I don't wear a mouth guard. Um, yeah. what was the deal with the negotiating at the end though? Like, I felt like that was, like, you know, because it was like normal 30, I want, what is it, like yeah, 20, 
Like the, it was just weird how it went down. Not that it's a huge thing. It was just like, huh, that didn't land like I thought. <laughs> like yeah. I think they thought it would, or at least I didn't think so. Because yeah. if you're doing the comedy aspect of like, I'm you and I are negotiating. I'm trying to get twenty percent. You're trying to go fifteen. Yeah. You know, right. I would instead of going twenty five to make you come up. I would go below you and then be like, ah, oh, shit. And you say deal. And then, you know, I'd be out even less or even yeah. more. So, yeah, it definitely seemed like there was a little bit of, I don't know, almost like that was trying to be like that kind of slapsticky. Oh, everybody's relieved. Now the danger's over. Yeah. We all feel good here at the end of the movie. And, you know, everybody's kind of giggling again, which I think a lot of movies do, but I feel like that, that is not necessarily, uh, a great thing for a sold out horror movie. And I feel like this movie definitely did have kind of a sense of humor and didn't take itself super seriously. Yeah. So that's an important thing to note in that this is sort of a different type of horror movie that we like in that it's not quite as dark, which feels weird to say, but you know, there, there are definitely like humorous moments throughout it and kind of clever tongue in cheek type stuff, which yeah. is very Tarantino, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, all in all, I was, yeah, I'm yeah. a huge fan of the film. Love it. That was yeah. the reason why we picked it. Um, Good one yeah. to come back on. Yeah, for sure. Did you watch it here or in Germany? I watched it here after oh, we nice. got back. Yeah, everything there was weird, like with and was it in German? stuff. And no, no, it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was that weird. Might, it was a weird language. I have no idea who said what anybody said in this movie, but it was compelling. <laughs> The, the way Clooney would say Donka Shane was just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> riveting. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, all I got left to say to you is guten Abend, my friend. All I got to say to you is... And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas, so if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions please send us an email at thehorrificpod at gmail.com or feel free to comment on or message our Facebook page. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening. Recording from dusk till dawn. Not, we're not going to record from dusk till dawn. You might not. Right, I'm, in. I'm starting to doubt your commitment to Sparkle Motion. Well, I get it. Let's do it.